on that note, that's what we're studying today. I've entitled today's message, Building for Blessing. And what we are doing is we are covering the last several verses of the Sermon on the Mount, where our great king gave us our great promise that those who belong to him will evidence a different kind of life, will live a different kind of life from everyone else. And that's a good thing. What the world values, what the world put, uh, puts weight to, um, uh, treasure upon, value upon, is so often the exact opposite of what you find value and worth and, um, and that attached to in Christ. What do I mean by that? Instead of wanting to be the one with the most toys and the most money, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you think you've obeyed every single rule and law that, that you found in the Old Testament, give away all of your possessions to the poor. And then, and then you can come back to me and call yourself holy. And the man left frustrated because he was not about to give everything that he had worked so hard to achieve away. But that's exactly what the Lord calls the Christian to. What did Paul say to the believers that he was preaching to, he said, I count everything else as loss for the cause of Christ. That's what he was concerned about. If Christ is glorified, I would rather not have a penny to my name than have a million dollars and my soul be destined for hell. So this, this is where we are today. We are, we are taking up the warning, the challenge, and the promise from our Lord to build for blessing. So, as we turn to Matthew 7, what we see starting in verse 24 is that Jesus is continuing this contrast between those who are on the, the way that is blessed and those who are on the way that is cursed. And he continues with the two sides, uh, the wise man who is building contrasted with the foolish man who is building. We have two houses that are being constructed, two different foundations, but they're all hit with the same storm. One house stands and one house is decimated. One house lies in ruins after the storm has made its way through. And I want our lives, the lives of everyone in here and the lives of our children to last through that storm. I want the Lord to come sweeping through and find a house that's worthy of his name because we started from the right place and we walked faithfully thereafter. That's what's important for a Christian. And that's what's important for someone who wants to leave a legacy of godliness in this world for our children and for our grandchildren. So today we're talking about building for blessing. So as Jesus has just talked about the difference between those who have made false professions of faith versus those who are truly sold out for Christ from the inside out, he continues on in verse 24 by giving another example of true versus false. So let's read verse 24. Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Notice the first word of verse 24. It's therefore. Whenever you see that word, that always is connecting what's, what you're reading then to what has already been stated. When it's therefore, that's uh, it's another way of saying in conclusion or to summarize or to repeat what was just said a moment ago, here's what you can expect to find. So as Jesus is contrasting false prophets from true prophets, false sheep from true sheep, false religion from true religion, he now continues to says there is a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And there's something that is present in the life of that wise man 
to differentiate him from the other side, which is the foolish man, one who acts like a fool, one who goes after empty things that have no meaning and no ultimate purpose, that have no ultimate value. That would be what the Bible talks about over and over again as foolish. The philosophies of the Greeks that that wasn't a faithful biblical way of looking at the world is an empty philosophy. It is devoid of spiritual worth and value. So, Jesus describes this wise man as doing two things. And here's our first blank. The blessed are those who hear, then do. The blessed are those who hear and then do. And oftentimes throughout scripture, you'll see that expression of hearing the words of God. And sometimes the context makes it clear that it's talking about, you know, the, the, uh, the audible hearing of something, or you could even say, you know, as you read it on the page, you could hear it in some way. But oftentimes the word for hear, it's used as an expression to, um, to give an example of receiving the instruction. And if you refuse the instruction, it's as though you stopped your ears. You put your hands up over them and you started shouting, I can't hear you, la, 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 la. Right? <laughs> Lloyd, Lloyd. <laughs> you, you've stuffed your ears with, with earplugs, with cotton balls. You've jammed wax in there just to make sure that the sound words of Jesus do not get through. And sadly, so many of us do that. So many people do that. They're confronted with the reality of the weight of sin and they scoff and they say, oh, come on, please. I don't need a savior. I can do it on my own. If I just grip my teeth, if I just pull myself up on my own bootstraps and not allow myself to get fatigued, then I'll, I'll overcome. And you may, you, you may uh, be able to put away certain behaviors, but your sin will still remain with you. Which is precisely why Martin Luther gave up his, uh, his efforts for years uh, to live as a monk. Because he realized, no matter how much I locked myself away in a, in a tower, you know, in a dank tower and just poured over scriptures all day and copied, you know, made new copies of, of the scriptures, he still realized that his sin followed him into that tower. Whatever room he walked into, his sin was still there. <laughs> meaning he was still there because every day we need to rely on the grace of Christ. Amen. Amen? We don't have to identify as, you know, I'm just a worthless sinner. No, I'm a son or daughter of the most high God. I've been redeemed. However, sin still tries to reassert its dominance in my life. And we have to fight it. By the blood of Christ, we will win. Because in Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? That's right. We could truly celebrate that today. So the blessed are those who hear, receive the teaching of Christ, receive the, the, um, the, the uh, revelation that Christianity is from the inside out. And then they do it. They know what the Lord has called them to, and they walk it out. That's the difference. Because many can even admit that Christianity makes sense. I, I would imagine that many of us know people who have said, yeah, I think the Bible has a lot of great things to say. I don't disagree you know, with it. You know, I don't disagree with Jesus' message. He says a lot of excellent things. I even love him to a certain extent, and their lives remain unchanged. Because you can understand something and still not have heard it. And that's the danger because over time, you'll become numb to that. And then you'll, then you'll start to rage against what should have been a glorious moment of the gospel reaching that fertile soil and causing you to cry out and receive that wonderful gift of salvation and eternal life. Instead, it turns into, gee, it's a nice message, but I'll take it from here. And that's exactly what the foolish man does. And, and we'll see why in just a second. 
So while the wise man builds, uh, hears, and then does what the Lord instructs him to do, the cursed, those who refuse God's grace, they are those who hear and then do what they wish. They build according to the plans that they have drawn out. They've taken out their own ruler and their own pencil and their own uh, protractor and compass, and they've made all the measurements, the schematics, and they've built according to their design. But what Jesus has been saying is that even though the Pharisees have been telling you, especially the Pharisees, they have been telling you, this is the way to live a faithful life. Even they have deviated from my design at places. And so I have come to set the record straight. So what happens here in verse 25? I'm sorry, yeah, so at the end of verse 24, we see a man begins to build and he's called a wise man because he builds on something. He builds on the rock. The word there is is Petros, and that is rock. And it's very similar to our word Peter, right? Our name, Peter. (laughs) I am a rock, a chip off the old block, right? (laughs) And what is Jesus talking about there? Because there's a different word that could have been used if Jesus was referring to a pebble, a stone small enough to, to fit in the size of your hand, you know, the size of your hand to fit in your hand. There's a different word that he could have used if he wanted to talk about a bunch of smaller size rocks. But what he's talking about is something much more significant. He's talking about a slab of stone. He's talking about bedrock. He's talking about the the face of a cliff. That's what you're building on. It is in that ground. It is stuck. It is not moving. It is unshakable and it will weather any storm that comes its way. That's what you're building on. That's the rock that the wise man is building on. And he's wise because he's building with a proper base for his life that will end up enduring the test of time. And I want everyone's life in here to last. So as we look at the wise man and the foolish man, there are similarities here, but there are also differences. So there are are men who both begin to build and they are both building a house. They're building something for them to reside in, for something uh, to to give them shelter, to give them comfort in their life. They're building something that, that they hope will remain They both begin that building project. And they even build in close proximity to one another. So they think they're building in a similar place, but they use different materials to build. And those different materials make all the difference. So the wise man, he builds, like I said a moment ago, on bedrock. That's our next blank. The wise man builds on bedrock. He builds on a rock strong enough to withstand even the most severe onslaught, even the, even the most raging flood waters. That's what he builds on. And another thing that's the same is that both houses are hit by the same storm. So what happens? Let's read verse 25. So the rain falls and the floods come, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. From the beginning to the end, it was built on a proper foundation. So it got slammed in every way, from above, from below, from horizontal, and it lasts. Then in verse 26, then Jesus now continuing the contrast, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
Now, one thing that's interesting to me is, is when you look at sand, it's a mixture. It, it's very tiny. You know, there's, there's, you know, hundreds of millions of grains of sand on a single beach. And it's made out of what was formerly rock, what was formerly bigger rocks or shells or bones or di different materials that have been disintegrated by, by the erosion over time of being in the water, uh, exposed to the elements, broken apart, becoming brittle over time with dryness and things like that, <coughs> excuse me, to the point now where it is so small that um, so much air can get between it. Even if you gather it all together, there's no stability to be found in it. You have to find something else to add to that sand to make it stick, to make it into concrete, right? But even concrete loves to crack. If you notice, with temperature, with moisture, concrete loves to crack. It's his favorite thing to do. As soon as you pour it, <laughs> the first rain, it, it could potentially start cracking. So this man begins to build and he thinks what was formerly a big rock, I can still build on that, right? It, at its essence, it's probably still the same material. It'll still last. He builds his house on the sand. And in verse 27, so we see here, the same storm comes, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Here's our next blank. Wrong foundations are not made to last. If we spend our lives trying to make a name for ourselves, if we spend our lives trying to find our identity in our job, deriving our sense of confidence in life or sense of pride just from what we do, we are building on a wrong foundation. If we try to find a spouse who is, uh, you know, who, who is uh, attractive to us, and we don't really care about the moral issues. You know, we don't really care about the uh, character of their lives as long as they look good. That's indicative of building on a wrong foundation. As a father, for instance, one of my responsibilities before the Lord is to make sure that my children honor God. I take that seriously. And so I'm teaching them from a very young age how to build on a right foundation. So what do we do? We wake up in the morning and before they go to their Christian school, we read a Bible verse. We read a section of scripture. We read a Bible story. And, and we ask them, my wife and I, we ask them, what sticks out to you? What, what have you learned through this? We go over memory verses. We're teaching them now while, they're, um, while their minds are so pliable right now and they're very impressionable. We're teaching them now to begin your day thinking about the Lord. When you're tempted to think about all the things you have to accomplish, all the toys that you want to play with in their case, all the things you'd rather be doing than sitting in class, right? we say, but first, before you even entertain that thought, let's see what the Lord has to say today. What does he have to say to us? And so we dig into the word. This is the foundation we build upon. If God says to go after it in his word, that's exactly what we chase. And then we make our priority list from there. Especially as guys, we, we take a lot of pride in our profession, right? Are you with me, guys? We all know this. If you own your own business, work in a shop, if, you, if you're a, a businessman, you're, you're uh, making deals, uh, you know, um, going after contracts, finding customers, clients, all of those things, we, we take that as a very sense of pride and it can really... Uh, be personal to us. And that's a good thing. And when it's done in right order, we remember that the Lord instructs us to do our work as unto him because he's our boss. Even if we own our own company, he's still our boss. And he gets to call the shots as, as to how our finances should be spent and saved and, and distributed, all of those things. And so 
the life of a believer is going to be built starting from that spot. Those who are merely pretending are going to give lip service to that at times. They may be able to, to uh, deceive some people into thinking they're building properly. But like Jesus said a few verses ago, by your fruit, you'll know whether they're a bad tree or a good tree. Because good fruit will not come from a bad tree. The foolish man builds on soft ground, which offers no strength in the coming storm. The foolish man builds on soft ground, which offers no strength in the coming storm. And sadly, that's why so many have been, have been uh, deceived into thinking that embracing all kinds of ungodliness and perversion and decadence and all of that stuff, allowing it to go on, allowing it to be welcomed in, even to the church, into our cities, into our families, and even into the church, being lulled into uh, believing that it's showing compassion to not speak uh, God's truth to people, to not try to rescue people from destructive decisions and destructive lifestyles and things that are going to lead outside of God's grace. So many people have, have said, I just, I, I would not want to be thought of as not nice. And they made it a rule that if, if anyone is ever displeased with the way that I talk, then I must be wrong. But Jesus never said that. In fact, he said, if you live a truly righteous life, you will be persecuted. It's going to happen. People are going to distance themselves from you if you make a stand for Jesus. And I know I, I went through my entire high school career never, never being invited to a second party. Because I got invited to the first one and then I said, well, I, I can't go there because I knew exactly what was going to be happening. And I'm like, I, I can't go. And they left me alone. And it was pretty alone. <laughs> it was pretty lonely being alone, right? <laughs> But God is big enough to, to have kept me and to keep your children and to keep you. But when you make a stand for Christ, people are oftentimes going to leave or they're going to even turn and vocally start to be against you. Jesus says you'll even encounter times where people will falsely accuse you of things. They'll slander you. They'll, they'll make up things about you in order to tear you down because they're actually feeling so convicted about the rightness of the stand that you have made. And that just all comes out of that ungodly spring, right? Because it's an endless source of sin and nastiness and corruption and all of that filth just continues to spring up. We never get enough of, of sin, right? Until the Lord finally wakes us up. He reaches out and by his spirit, he wakes us up to the fact of that we are in desperate need of salvation. And there, in that moment, we find him waiting to receive us. Our glorious Savior, bringing us into blessing. So even though these men, presumably they're building close together, they're both building a house. The houses look very similar. But one difference there has made all the difference. Wrong foundations are not made to last. If you rely on the belief that because you're kind or you care about family or because you help others from time to time as your, um, as your ticket to heaven, it's not going to be enough. It was formerly rock, but it's actually shifting sand. And when that storm comes, when God's judgment comes to test the quality of your construction, it will be left bored, separated from bored. And here's an example of someone who built on a false foundation. Uh, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, in verse 17 and, and following, we see that Simon, who was a sorcerer, the magician, he goes up to the apostles who are doing miracles in the Lord's name, and he's seeing the Holy Spirit working, and himself being very familiar with the magical arts, he seeks to have 
the Lord's power added to his own because that's what he was after in the first place. I want to control my environment. I want to be the one to just, uh, you know, to do an incantation or, you know, say that magical formula of things and have uh, my will happen in the life of someone else, in this situation, to have my crops grow. I'm going to, you know, cast a spell on them, all of those things. So he offers, he offers the apostles money in exchange for an impartation of the Holy Spirit. And, and the apostles slap him around and say, may your money die with you. You cannot purchase the Lord. By the way, he has already purchased you on the cross in order to liberate you and rescue you from the hard taskmaster of sin and its father, the devil, the enemy of our souls. And so Simon the sorcerer is now confronted with a choice. Do I come to the Lord on his own terms or do I try to just get all the blessings of being a son of God without the commitment of a son of God, without going through the adoption process? Some people can call themselves a Christian, but they haven't gone through the adoption process. And their fruit will find them out. And you'll know, it may take a while for you to see what's actually coming out of their life, but eventually it will become very public that they in fact were not truly after the Lord. They were after influence or power or prestige. Even in the Christian world, we can see it. People try to angle because they know what Christian people like to hear or like to see. And then they create for themselves a little platform, <coughs> excuse me, that they can make money off of or that they can have people swooning over them in. And the Lord hates it. Another example is the rich man uh, that's, that's, uh, who is talked about in Luke 16. He's talked about as being a very wealthy man, a man of high esteem in the community, but he couldn't be bothered to help those less fortunate around him. He lived his entire life trying to get, get, get for himself, not thinking of others. And when he takes his last breath on earth, he crosses over and comes face to face with the reality of his choices. And he cries out to Abraham in this, in this, um, in this experience. He cries out to Abraham, I, I know I'm in torment, but can you please just get me a single drop of water to cool my tongue? Because I can't take it in here. And Abraham has to remind him that there's only one chance at life. And once you take your last breath here, and go before the Lord, that's the end. You'll either be welcomed in as a son or daughter cherished by him, or you'll have to live outside of his grace. That's a sobering thought, right? But this is exactly why Jesus is talking the way he is, why he's coming, coming at people so strongly and emphatically. Because even those who should have known him who studied the scriptures for thousands of hours, they are living no better than the pagans. They are seeking to just build influence in the community, have people giving their valuables to them, wearing the most religious clothing, praying in the most uh, conspicuous spots so that everyone can marvel at their faith. All the while, Jesus sees their hearts and he knows you're only doing this so others will praise you not because you love me. So we see the same storm hits every home. And the storm is representative of the judgment of God. That's our next blank. The storm is representative of the judgment of God. So when God comes to judge your life, those who have built upon him will remain. You will get to enjoy that blessing. You may have, uh, you know, uh, you may have some scars from the walk that you've had to endure throughout your life. You may have some signs of weathering. The storm may leave some marks uh, on the house, but you'll have stood, and the Lord will be proud of what you allowed Him to do through your life. 
In several places in, in the Old Testament, especially, we, we see the judgment of God likened to a storm. So this is very much in keeping with how God has revealed his actions in time. In Jeremiah 23, Isaiah 28, Ezekiel 13, and other places, we see examples of God's judgment coming as a storm. And so I think that's, that's why Jesus is using that example here. And so Jesus has led up to this in Matthew 5, 6, and now through 7, up to the very end. We see that there are two types of life. There is one that you can enjoy now, and then it ends. Or there's one that you can enjoy now and enjoy forever. So in verse 28, when Jesus ends with those words, and great was its fall, the house that the foolish man built. When he had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. They were left speechless, verse 28. They didn't even know what to say. They didn't know how to respond because he had challenged everybody and he had lifted the, the, uh, his law, the standard of his law back up safely out of human reach. So now what do we do? Well, he told you, you need a righteousness that exceeds even the most outwardly righteous among you. You need something that goes deeper and further than they could ever take you. And that only comes from me. You need to be those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You need to be those who ask and keep asking who seek and keep seeking, those who knock and continue knocking. It is those who will be welcomed in. It is those with whom the Lord will be. And why were they astonished at Jesus' teaching? Why were they left with, with, with jaws dropped to the floor at his teaching? Because he was teaching them as one having authority not as their scribes. And as many of you may be aware, the scribes were the ones who were responsible for copying uh, you know, the, the older parchments, the older scrolls that were starting to deteriorate and become you know, unreadable over time. The ink was fading, all of that. They were responsible for continuing to make copies so that the following generations could have a, could have a clear text to read from when they gathered to worship God and, and in their homes and all of that. And they were also tasked with studying the scriptures so they could be uh, very knowledgeable. They would study the teachers from past generations, how they explained the word of God to help people apply it to their lives. And that's what the scribes would help uh, for the people to understand better how to apply God's word to their lives. But what they would do is they would quote the teachers of old. They would say, well, this rabbi from this century, he used to say this. Here's how he explained this passage. Here's how uh, this was understood in, you know, 400 years ago. And they would, they would be humble in their speech like that. But what was Jesus teaching? He said, in, in a few examples in, um, uh, in earlier passages of the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And even though he was just quoting a proper scripture back to them, he was speaking as though he was the one who wrote it. And it left them speechless. <laughs> so here's what we can remember as we, as we, um, as we conclude this, this great sermon from our great king. We can know this. When we come to the Lord on his terms we will experience his blessing, both here and in glory. When we entrust our lives and everything in it to the Lord, we can then live confidently in our future. I'm sorry, confident of our future. And the true Christian life is lived when we remain aware of what we have been saved from and what we have been called into. We have been saved from helplessness in our sin. And instead, we have been called into his marvelous light. 
and we have been called to be disciples. Both men, every man and every woman is called to lay down their lives before the Lord, figuratively, right? And, and commit everything that's in our lives to the Lord's service. And that which he tells us to pick up again, that which he renews, that which he sanctifies, then we can move on boldly and confidently with. And we have been called into his marvelous light, amen? So remember that, saints. Remember what we have been saved from and where God is calling us to. And that's so important. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.